Spirit. So I thought with our topic today of confirmation that I would uh, uh, wear a fiery jacket here. Thank you so much. It was actually the quickest thing I could find. So who knows what would have been the next one in line if I needed a sweatshirt. Uh, by the way, I love the Oakdale Fire Department. I know a number of them. Some of them are parishioners here and they are terrific. So whenever you have a chance, make sure you thank our good people who who keep us safe and secure around here. The topic today is confirmation. And I wish to go at it in a particular way, a somewhat practical way, really. And that is this. I have a goal that this parish, Transfiguration Parish, be a dynamo of spiritual life. A place where the power and life and the graces of the Holy Spirit are very, very alive and active. I'll say a little bit more about why I think that's important, but I just want to make clear that this is not a mere oh, sort of theological and theoretical exercise. I want the Holy Spirit here. I want everyone who walks in here to experience the light, the grace, and power of the Holy Spirit, and that's my goal. And I really believe God is ready to do that. So this is a kind of a call to action, not just a kind of a, a little bit of a discourse about this. Let's take a look at what happened when the Holy Spirit was given to the first disciples. We could have a long list, but let's talk about just a few of the important elements. One of them, the first one, was the praise of God. These folks came out of that experience when the tongues of fire fell, and their first response was to praise God. And that might seem kind of bland and kind of to be expected, but I am convinced there is power in praise. Tremendous power. Many of you, just about any of you, who ever come to me for confession, if you come to me all grumpy and down and out, who knows what else, you'll know that one of the things I say to you is, God wants to give you a beautiful spirit of gratitude and praise. Because one of the things that happens when we really have a habit of giving praise to God, and by the way, that beautiful distinction is very helpful. We thank God for what He does for us, and we praise God for who He is for us. And the beauty of that is you're having a bad day, you can still praise the Lord. Feel a little sick, you can praise the Lord. No heat in the church, you can still praise the Lord. All right? Praise doesn't have to go up and down based on those things. All right? Because God is God on a rainy day, a sunny day. If you're having a cold, and then that. God is still doing great that day. And you can give praise to God's greatness on any day of all. So that's one of the first characteristics from the Holy Spirit. We'll know the Holy Spirit is having His way of transfiguration when people are eager to praise the Lord. And they don't sort of look at you cross-eyed when you say, praise God. They go, of course, let us praise God. That is one of the first signs of the presence of the Holy Spirit. The second sign is courage. And a very particular kind of courage is as seen at Pentecost. A courage to give witness. And I believe that we at Transfiguration are meant to be sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with many more people than we do. Looking for opportunities for that. Not having to do it reluctantly. Oh, I hope I can get through my whole day without ever letting people know I'm Catholic. You know, oh, it was a good day. I was able to sneak it through, you know? No. One of the signs of the Holy Spirit is He takes these scaredy cat apostles and makes them filled with boldness to give praise and bold witness to Christ. And again, we'll talk about this. This isn't just something that happens 2,000 years ago. You have young people, perhaps, very young people, who have the power of Christ and the Holy Spirit in them. They will give witness. They'll tell you. They'll tell you in childlike terms, but I hear it. They come home from church, and they're eager to talk about what God did for them at church and so forth. The courage to give witness is a true sign of the Holy Spirit. What's the third one? It's what you saw in the early church. You saw them gathered together. You can give it different names, but you saw them in community. You know, community is so many times discussed. You know, why don't we have a stronger parish community? And let's try to build up our community here, blah, 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 blah. Okay, it's treated almost like a mere sociological phenomenon. Okay, we have to do these tricks. 
that everyone learns are good. Okay, we're going to have some ice breaking games. Right? Okay, community. Community is something that the Holy Spirit puts in our hearts. And He puts it into our hearts whether we're outgoing, whether we're shy, whether we're into people, whether we like small group discussions, whether we are allergic to small group discussions, all right? It's a God-given gift that comes to us. You know, I've said to many of you that, you know, my father suffered from social anxiety disorder. It was very difficult for him to socialize. He didn't come to my ordination. He didn't come to two of my siblings' four weddings and so forth, all right? All right? Very difficult. I have very strong, very strong uh, uh, respect for those who struggle with different sorts of social anxiety disorders. But, this might strike you as a big deal, but he came to Mass every Sunday until finally he had his stroke at the age of 87. Now you might say, big deal. It is a big deal if you've got social anxiety disorder, okay? It's even worse when you're as clever and funny as he was. I mean, he, was, he would draw people, you know? He had like all of a sudden, people want to see him at church because he's, he, he's, like, he's very clever, okay? Then he'd have to switch to a different church to go to because he, <laughs> he was overwhelmed with, you know, just and so forth. He was something. <laughs> I told you some of the stories. You know? He would, at the sign of peace, he'd say to like somebody next to him, may God forgive you for your many, many sins. <laughs> My mother was like scandalous. <laughs> People loved it. Oh, this guy's a cool guy. Okay. <laughs> he was not a big fan of the sign of peace. Maybe that's another reason. <laughs> okay. Community. It's a spiritual phenomenon when God sends His Holy Spirit. It's not just a matter of preference or style and so forth. The early disciples came together. And then, of course, one of those beautiful signs that we often talk about, the saints often talk about, which is joy in suffering. You've all heard, you know, the so-called infallible sign of the Holy Spirit is joy. You, know, you want to see whether someone has the ghost, you look and see whether they're joyful and so forth. And specifically, as we see in the early church, joy in the midst of suffering. People going through terrible persecutions and hostilities. You know, you have Paul and Silas, you know, praising the Lord in prison during the night. And of course, the earthquake and all the miracles, the other... Uh, of prison earthquake with St. Peter, okay? There's just nothing could get them, all right? You have great, great joy as a sign of the Holy Spirit. Well, trust me, trust me, if transfiguration could be characterized by these qualities, I'm telling you again, we'd have to build another gathering space, a couple more church spaces, and so forth, because this is what people are hungering for. The human heart was made to give praise to God to have, a, to have an outlet to be able to give thanks to God. The human heart was made not to live life in fear and in anxiety and in dread and all the rest. All right, Lord, you satisfy the hungry heart. And we've got it. We've got the Holy Spirit. Ah, but, uh, you know, as somebody said very carefully and theologically, uh, for some reason we leak. <laughs> we receive the Holy Spirit we continue to receive the Holy Spirit through the sacraments above all and yet there's so little sign so little evidence of this now let's just clear the brush a little bit first of all we want to make sure we're not seeing this purely in terms of emotions or style and so forth you know I, uh, you know, there's certain people that feel like in order to really give witness to the Holy Spirit you know they need to have huge artificial smiles you know, I, I, uh, I knew a friend who was with the Up With People group. Remember that years ago? They'd sing at stadiums, Up, up With People. Well, they had to train how to have smiles you could see from the upper bleachers. Freaking smiles. Ah, you know, if you're within 100 feet, it's like, stop doing that, okay? This is it's demonic and so forth, all right? So some of us feel like if we're going to give witness, we have to have a very outside, styly thing. And some of us like to do that, but many of us don't, you know? In fact, I have been touched by some very, very quiet people. Very un prepossessing who actually show witness to the Holy Spirit. This is not a matter of show. This is not a matter of outside style and so forth. I just want to note that. The second thing I want to note here is that it's not something with high drama. You know, sometimes I would find as I would be a part of charismatic prayer groups, it was like you had to have a, a union car from the drama society and so forth, you know? Just like, too much, you know? How are you doing? Oh, 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 let me tell you the 32 and a half things God has done today. It's like, 
Okay, I don't think I need that very much. All right, very good. All right, little TMI spiritually. All right, so we're not talking about a drama thing. That that's a sign the Holy Ghost is in you. The life is full of crashing waves and earthquakes and and Beethoven symphonies and so forth. All right, much of the work of the Holy Spirit happens in a very quiet way, and we should make sure we're not down on that or think that that's wrong. I've told you before. My aunt Weezy said it best. She said the Holy Spirit is very shy. The Holy Spirit is very shy. You have to look for his fingerprints. If you learn to look carefully, you can see signs of his presence. But he typically, he could do it. He is the Holy Spirit. But he doesn't typically say, listen to me, look at me. I want to draw a lot of attention and so forth. So I want to clear away some of those preconceptions that we might have, those misconceptions we might have. Yet I'm talking about the fact that I think for many of us and for many Catholics, the Holy Spirit is not nearly as active and alive as he could be. Now, we have all sorts of ways of explaining this. Let's go back to what we believe sacramentally as Catholics. We believe that grace, including the sacramental grace, has both an objective and subjective character. All right? We say it most particularly when we talk about the Holy Eucharist. I'm sure we've all heard about this, you know? That the grace that's given to us in Holy Communion through the Holy Eucharist is objective. It comes to us whether we're having a good day or a bad day. It comes to us whether the priest is having a good day or a bad day and so forth, all right? It's grace that operates according to the actual operation of the sacrament. If you have the sacrament done validly, the grace comes to us. And that's very helpful because, of course, we live in a very subjective age in which people don't feel anything, you know? And they, and, and, they, and they feel like Father didn't really have the full energy he should have, not to mention what we think of the musicians and the lector and the lady next to us and so forth, all right? Okay, so grace operates as it operates. It gives us what it's supposed to give us. But the church also teaches, also teaches us that we have a real part to this. The grace of God doesn't simply overwhelm us. <laughs> I'm crushed by the grace of God. I can't stand it. Oh, come on. We all know that God chooses, freely chooses, to make us the kind of creatures who can respond or not respond to that grace. And so there's many elements that do make an impact on how well we receive. Again, to use the example of Holy Communion and going to Mass. Certainly our dispositions as we come to Mass. Certainly, of course, being free of, of sin, that's a very objective thing in fact. But also our way of having faith, expectant faith, teaching our children, ourselves, what is happening here? This is no happy meal, this is no mere picnic and so forth. We are receiving the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. So there are ways that our approach, our disposition, our response to the grace of God does have a huge effect. So the same is true with confirmation and the works, all the works and graces of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about this. Again, sometimes I use, people use cutesy images. I find some of them are pretty helpful. The one I've often used is someone knocks on the door, they hand you a gift. It's a big box. It's a big package. You say, thank you very much. You put it on your shelf. Someone comes along and says, what's that? You say, it's a gift. Well, what is it? I don't know. Aren't you going to open up? No, I don't know. It's a gift. That's all I need to worry about. I received a gift. I've got a gift on the shelf. Hoo -hoo. Okay? And then hopefully your friend says, um, duh. Gifts are meant to be opened. And you're meant to pull the thing out of the box, whatever it is. You know? If, if we have a, a catcher's mitt for baseball in the box up there, it's wonderful. Yes, you truly have a catcher's mitt, but it's not doing any good for you until you take it out and use it. And that's not a bad way of understanding what happens with the Holy Spirit given to us in the sacraments, including the sacrament of confirmation. Now, let's go back for just a second. This is not the most important thing, but I think for some of us, we've got to get clear about this. We talked about the community, and I want to say for a second that part of the reason why this is a good talk to give, not just to you, and also to you, and also to you, but to give to us together, is as a reminder that in most cases, People are open to as much of the Holy Spirit as the people around them. Did you get that? People typically are as open to the breadth, the width of all the variety of the acts of the Holy Spirit according to the people around them. By the way, including the saints. This is one reason why everybody, including every child, should read lots of saints' books. Because it's when you read the life of Felicity and Perpetua and their martyrdom and so forth. 
that a child reading that, who might normally be a scaredy cat, suddenly reads and learns, wow, you know, I don't have to be afraid that I can be strong and courageous. It's true with reading about the saints. It's true about being together with each other. Let me give you another example. Back when I was active in the charismatic renewal movement, again, it was very interesting because I got around. I was down in the south, you know, and I was in the Midwest. I was all over the place. And those different charismatic prayer groups, all praying, it sounds the same. We pray for the Holy Spirit. We pray for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, Well, surprise, surprise, what actually happened in most of those groups was if that was a group that had people speaking in tongues, surprise, surprise, the people who were prayed with for the Holy Spirit, they began to speak in tongues more frequently. You had another place where people perhaps had very expressive praise and they were very able just to give worship and praise to God freely. Surprise, surprise, people who received the Holy Spirit's baptism, blah, 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 they had that quality too. Now, you might respond cynically and say, well, this, does, this shows it's all a fraud because, you know, it's all the power of suggestion and so on. Well, there's plenty of that around, including in spiritual groups. So don't get me wrong about that. I could, I could, I could really tell you stories if I had something more than water here. But, <laughs> but the fact is that for most of us, most of the time, we expect as much of the Holy Spirit as we see happening around us. This is why, to put it in a global perspective, and some of you have traveled enough, you know this. There are many parts of the world where the normal Catholic parish mass is filled with demons being cast out of people, people being healed, physically healed, people having powerful experiences. You go to many places in Africa, in Latin America, in the Philippines, in parts of India. You go to many parts of the world that aren't white, all right, I just said that. Oh, some of us, we Northern Europeans, we understand because we went to college fields. Oh, blah, okay? <laughs> and you look and you see these people and you say, they're fevered, they're sick, there's something, they're, that's not Catholic. Well, do the math, honey. More Catholics around the world right now are doing this stuff than you are. And you might think up here in Northern white land, normal Catholic life looks like something. You just get on a, a plane and go anywhere, anywhere. <coughs> and you're going to see that this is the normal Catholic life in many, many parts of the world. And tell me who's being biblical and who's not. Who believes in the spirit and who doesn't and so forth. You know, like, like I've said before, we Catholics have become so cold that anyone who is really in the right place, we say they're fevered, you know? Because we don't know what the normal Catholic life looks like. It looks like a lot more than what we have. Or take another example. Take another example. Our young people, okay? Why aren't our young people storming out of our Catholic high schools giving witness to people? Saying, we want to bring all of our friends to Christ. We want to get them to Mass. Oh, gosh. I love Catholic <laughs> high schools. The only problem is there are not enough non-Catholics because I'd really like to bring non-Catholics to the Catholic faith. Where's that spirit? You know, and why not, okay? And of course, you know, you know you can press my button anytime. You know, we confirm these young people. They walk into the cathedral dressed nice, looking a little like diffident, you know. They walk out of the cathedral still looking nice, still looking a little diffident. And what the heck just happened? Oh, Father, they received the Holy Spirit. Yes, they did. And I just said it five minutes ago. The grace of the Holy Spirit has been given to them. But do we expect do we expect anything? Well, Father, I, I would hope that, I don't know, somehow, somehow God would touch them, you know, and their lives are a mess, and they just, oh, little, oh, little, somehow, you know, so, you know. Oh, boy. I'd never want to be a bishop, all right? But if I was, I might stop them, you know? It doesn't, it doesn't forbid that anymore. It says you tattoo, peace be with you, okay? <laughs> There's more than one way to say peace be with you, all right? <laughs> you know, I really think we have just, just lost it with our expectations for our young people. It should happen. And I go right back to these lists. We should expect our children to be gutsy. We should expect our children to praise God, and not just because they're being forced to. And I think you know there are young people around, here, there, there, and there, who have the telltale signs of the Holy Spirit. And we need to go back and ask them, how did that happen? When did it happen? Where did it happen? 
and it would be very interesting. Why aren't we listening to our young people who have the faith? I'll tell you some of it. Now, some of it's not very dramatic, but I'll tell you what it is. You know, I see many of these signs among children who are homeschooled. Oh, Father, don't you bring that up. That's controversial. <laughs> well, I've got a lot to say. But I'll say one thing about homeschool. The typical homeschool family experience, listen to this, involves children spending more time with grown-ups than with other children their age. And that's why some people are horrified by it. Oh, how are they going to learn their proper socialization skills? Blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. No. I find those children have greater confidence, greater interactive interest and confidence in grown-ups and so forth than other children and so forth. All right? What some people are talking about, they don't like about some homeschool kids, is that some homeschool kids spend too much time with their mothers after they've reached a certain age. Yes, I just said that too, and I said it to homeschool parents. Catholic schools never had boys with women teaching them by the time they hit 14 and 16. That's why when we went to a Catholic boys' high school, you had brothers teaching. Because at a certain point, boys need masculine influences. And I mean masculine, daily, hours a day influence. And I've said that to homeschool families. Do not try to approach your 14-year-olds the same way you approach your 8-year-olds. But let me get back to my point, because you know I love editorials. Let me get back to my point, which is what beautiful thing that's happening in those homeschool environments is these young people, just like I said before, are looking to see what their parents live their faith like. Do their parents love the Blessed Mother? Do their parents go to Mass and love to go to Mass and go to confession and all the rest? And the Holy Spirit tends to work in people according to the people they already see who, quote, have the Holy Spirit. So, as we sit here at Transfiguration Parish, say, we've got to get more people fired up and so forth. Yeah, let's just take a look at ourselves, for example. And once again, I'm not talking style. I'm not talking about outward show. But I'm saying God has put into each soul a sense of when they have found the Holy Spirit's presence. It's that old, you know, Chesterton, you know, uh, uh, little beau mole. You know, he says, you know, he says, you know, an open mind, like an open mouth, slams shut when it finds solid food. Okay? Okay? When a person finds the truth, finds the real stuff, they get it, they see it, they smell it, they notice it, and they will receive it. If we have the Holy Spirit alive in our lives here, we should expect many people to be able to sense what it is. Now, let's go back for a second. We know every sacrament has, again, a foundation in Jesus Christ. It was instituted by Christ. The foundation, the institution of the sacrament of confirmation surprises some people. It's a double one. Again, one of them is Easter Day. As you know, in the Gospel, on Easter Day, sometime later than the resurrection, Jesus comes through the wall and says, Peace be with you, and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now he goes on to institute for them, in a certain part, a partial way, the sacrament of holy orders. He also did that at the Last Supper. Most of us associate Pentecost. So those two times are understood by the church to be the institution by Christ. Him specifically breathing on the, holy, uh, on the apostles, saying, receive the Holy Spirit. That's why we say that when we confirm a, a child or a young person. The bishop says that. But we also understand it has its origins in the great day of Pentecost. Matter and form, again, every sacrament has matter and form, the Aristotelian categories that we take on ourselves as Catholics. Again, the matter is the stuff in this case. Again, it is the uh, oil, the sacred chrism oil that's placed on, typically on the forehead of the person to be confirmed. Although also, the church teaches, the matter is also the imposition of the bishop's hands on the person's head, whether it's their forehead or cheek and so forth. That's the matter. The form are the words that the bishop says as the person is confirmed. Again, it's a two-part uh, prayer. The first is what he prays to all of them. And then as he one by one goes and says to them about receiving the Holy Spirit and so forth, that completes the form. So matter and form as in every sacrament. Now, let's take a step back to some of us who are old enough to remember. Not only did we have to learn what the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit were, but we were told by sister, you better watch out because the bishop's coming down that aisle and he might turn to young little Margaret. What were you called as a child, Margaret? Peggy. Peggy. He might turn to young Peggy and say, name the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit and so forth. 
Let's talk a little bit, and you knew them, of course. You had them ready, backwards, forwards, and, and inside out, and so forth. Now, let's take a step back for a second. We talked, really, on the very first talk about how the sacraments work. We talked about grace. And grace operates in many ways. We said in the second uh, talk in more detail. Now, let's remember that one of the ways that grace works is through what we call charisms. Charism, again, is a Greek word that then got taken up actually by Latin as well. But it has to do, according to the church's teaching, with gifts given for the sake of others. In other words, you have received a beautiful gift, perhaps. Let's, uh, there's, we're talking about the list of these. You've been given the gift of hospitality. Now, that is not given to you so that you can have a little tea party with yourself at home, all right? You know, oh, I know just what I, I need a napkin. Oh, I want a nice, a nice, okay. A little creepy Chrissy, okay? Like, okay, it's not given to us for ourselves. These are gifts given to us for others. Now, as silly as that example sounded, I think some of us don't get that clear, all right? <clears throat> Including priests, all right? All right? Whatever gifts a priest have are not for himself, they are for others. And you can tell whether the priest gets that or not, all right? But God gives us different gifts. Now, the gifts are listed in different ways, and some of us are a little bit too nervous about having exactly the right list. Because, again, you have this ancient list that comes to us out of Isaiah that's then taken on as the sevenfold gift of the Spirit. There's even questions about what exactly is the seventh of the seven gifts. Then you have other sets of gifts listed. All right? You have listed, for example, the famous list that are sometimes called the charismatic gifts uh, in 1 Corinthians. Again, talking about in 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14 about a variety of gifts and often they come up with a list of nine and perhaps you've heard that list before. That was the list that many people involved in the charismatic movement looked at. Then, of course, in between those you have the notion of faith, hope, and charity, which are both virtues, again, theological virtues, the theological virtues, they're also gifts. Each of you receives graces and gifts for faith, hope, and charity uh, with every sacrament that you receive, all right? Now, then you have other gifts that are listed. Again, St. Paul, you don't ever, don't ever accept, expect St. Paul to just keep things nice and tidy, okay? <laughs> Dream on, sister, all right? Okay, at one point he has a set of lists. Some of them have to do with certain kinds of leadership in ministry. Some he is called the apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some teachers, some helpers, and so forth. You see a variation on that elsewhere. Now, please notice, though, that what he says explicitly, he says, these gifts are given for the building up, he uses that phrase a lot, the building up, the edification of the body of Christ. I love the fact that the Bible is so architectural. Isn't that great? Right. Lots of good images there, all right? So here's the point. God visits transfiguration with his graces. And he does so because he's got a plan. And he needs some workers. And part of the reason why the church is so weak in so many places is because he's been expecting to you over there to do some things. And you've either said, oh, not me. I am not worthy. Oh, you know, I, shouldn't, I can't do that and so forth. So then the Lord, basically, the Lord says, fine, God bless you. I'll put you on a shelf and I'll come back and talk to you in a couple years and so forth. All right? Now, in many cases, those charisms are related to our vocation. This is not a talk on vocation. I'll give one of those in a couple weeks. But let's be clear. God gives us what we need to be a good husband, a wife, a mother, a father, a priest, a celibate religious and so forth, all right? That's a very important point. And I say it because I used to have to say it a lot to my, my uh, seminarians. You know, I, I said to someone, I said, now you have to prepare, go ahead and study and get holy and keep going to confession and all that kind of thing. But trust me, many of the graces that come to you, come to you as you get ordained a priest. And that's true of marriage as well. It's true of being a mother and a father. And most of us here who are moms and dads know it. You say to yourself, I wasn't sure I could handle kids, you know, especially that first one, and then, and, and also that second one, and then, oh, and then there was a third one, and so forth, all right? Yeah. And perhaps there were many struggles of different kinds, but you also saw God give you graces. Now, one of the reasons I mention this is because God doesn't just give permanently His graces. You know, when I became a priest, people got all sorts of spiritual, but, but Bill, you know, didn't God give you graces to be an architect? And, 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 and are you burying your talents in the ground like the Bible says not to? Oh, okay. God gives each of us far too many gifts and talents ever to use at the same time. 
And every once in a while I meet a Catholic who is obsessed with this. Well, you know, I can play the guitar. And, and I also seem to have the gift of, of leading small groups. And, and I just got to use all of these gifts. Otherwise, you know, otherwise what? You know? Otherwise your ego won't get inflated like it is right now. Okay? And more to the point, God gives his gifts maybe for the next six months while your husband's going through a terrible illness. And God gives you strength beyond your own strength to care for him. And that's not your style of doing it. But somehow you're able to do it. And it's not forever and ever. You know, part of, the, part of my joy in getting ordained at the age of 39 is to look back on all kinds of things I used to do before this. All right? Bye-bye. Oh, don't, don't, don't. Bye-bye. You know? And some of them I still do. You know? But many things I used to do, I used to be good at. I don't do them anymore. And I'm okay with that. Some of us are very clingy with gifts. I have my special gifts. And, and careful, careful. You know, I told you before, I was a part of our brotherhood where we purge our clothing once a year. If you didn't use it for a whole year, give it away. A great idea. A great idea. A great idea. Take a look at your closet. If you've been through a complete cycle of spring, winter, fall, summer, okay? You never wore that sweatshirt, give it away. Oh, give it away, all right? The same can be true some ways of gifts. Don't simply presume that because I used to use a gift and exercise a gift of the Holy Spirit that I have to keep doing it, you know? I mean, some people just hang on too long with those sorts of things, etc. I'm counting on all of you. At a certain point, as my mind deteriorates and so forth, you're going to hear me preach and go, Father, Father, I think there's other beautiful ministries that God has called. <laughs> don't tell me that! I'm Father Smith. I'm Father Joe. I'm Father. I'm Father Bear. Don't tell me that, okay? Okay. Okay. We all have our limits, all right. But the beautiful thing to remember is this: that for most of us, that's exactly the opposite issue. The uh, real issue is so many of us. God has given gifts, and He wants us to exercise those gifts. Listen to what I said. They primarily function through our state of life. The worst thing are married people, family people spending too much time at church. Did I just say that? I did. Watch out for that. What are they escaping? Why aren't they home more? And so forth. Just like, by the way, just watch out for any priest that just seems to be flitting here, there, and everywhere. You know, why isn't he ever just like at church? Why can't he say Mass every day? What is he doing that he can't say Mass every day? All right? Our gifts flow out of our state of life. The second thing to remember is this, is that gifts are not our possession. I don't take it, lock it in the bank forever and so forth, all right? You know, God gives his gifts as long as he wants, when he wants, and so forth. Give thanks to God when he gives them to you, and give thanks to God when he takes them away. That is the how the Spirit works. Now, the next thing I want to say briefly about confirmation is this, is that Again, to go back to this notion, and here's, uh, where's Justin? There's Justin. He knows this. That our typical approach is this. Let's say in the case of, you know, we're going to have a bunch of eighth graders confirmed. Okay, let's say we have, how many do we have getting confirmed this year? Around 50. Around 50, all right. All right, 50 young people getting confirmed need at least 50 adults actively working with them. They need 50 strong Catholics, 50 uh, committed witnessing Catholics, Catholics that you can point to and say, be like him, be like her, be like them, and so forth. Where did we get this notion? Again, that we hire some guy over there to play basketball and help them to be confirmed. Or even, oh, we're going to have one or two extra catechists. We've got Ralph Pierre, here. he's helping and so forth. Where did we get that notion? Again, at the risk of uh, being redundant, let me remind you of every form of initiation that cultures have ever had. The most famous for us more recently was when Roots came out. If you ever read Roots, okay? What do you have in that, that account of his origins? Again, the young men of their tribe were taken away at night quite violently, taken away by the elders, taken away from mom, and taken away from all their familiarity. They were taken outside. The uh, sociologists called it called elimination, meaning taken to the edge, okay? They were taken to the edge, and they were initiated through a whole series of ways in the way of their tribe. All right? They were brought into the lore, the traditions. They went through all sorts of training and practicalities and so forth. Then they went through some initiations, and when they came back, they came back as adult members of that tribe. 
They look different, they were expected to act differently, and that's how every culture brought young people into adulthood, into maturity, and so forth. You had religious orders. You go off to join the order, whether it's a nun's group, or brother's group, or priest group. What do you do? You first of all get a different haircut. You, they, they shave your head or do something, because hair is huge. If you don't think hair is huge, you haven't been around young people enough, all right? There's special hair, done their special way, and so forth. Nope, you get out of it. You're given a different way of dress. Dress is very crucial. You never step in and dress the same way as you did before you entered uh, into those religious orders. You get a new name, all right? You know, you're given a new name. When you join that religious order, you are becoming a new person. And you expect it, outside, inside, a whole way of life, a whole detail. How about if you join the army, the military? They change your hair. They change your uniform. They change everything. And they teach you the most ridiculous, stupid, worthless things. Why? Because you're starting to think like a new person. And everything is different for you. It's even true with sports. Football perhaps more famously. But all the sports teams that take it seriously, when you go for Hell Week in August, why do they call it Hell Week? Because the coaches are going to have you live a different life. And you do not call mommy, you do not go running home with tears, but instead you're going through a whole new initiation in how you're a member of that team and so forth. Every culture got that until ours. <laughs> until ours. In which we have a few little like relics of all that little like evolutionary tailbones all right we're going to take these children on an entire 24 hour retreat <gasps> yes and they might bring their cell phones we hope not oh we hope not okay and they're going to live exactly the same way they're going to hang with their exact same three friends they always hang out with they're going to sit in the corner and smirk and so forth you know but this is the all-powerful confirmation retreat. Woohoo! You know? And this is going to transform them. No suffering involved, no change, no, no formation and so forth. But kazam, shazam, they're going to come back as these marvelous things that we want them to be. Oh, come on. Come on. Let's decide we're not even going to expect much with that, okay? Let's decide right now we're just cheating them, you know? As I said at Mass over there, we don't believe in that grace is free. We believe that grace is cheap. All right, we're gonna give them a little tiny retreat, a little of this, a little of that, ask them to wear a red tie, confirmation. Oh, isn't that something? We need to ask ourselves, are we prepared? Are we prepared to do what it takes to give our young people a fighting chance, a fighting chance to experience a measure of all the graces that God has? It. Grace for holiness, grace for conversion, grace to give witness, grace for joy in suffering. I think if we really want to do it, it's not actually a mystery about what we do. I've told you before my solution. One of you is going to win the lottery. You're going to give me your $35 million. I'm going to go out and buy Confirmation Island in the South Pacific, all right? <laughs> and we're going to fly our young people there, all right? No cell phones, none of that stuff and so forth, all right? They'll be there for a month and get radically initiated. And then when they come back, we will treat them differently. We will treat them as adults. Now, let's not whip ourselves. Part of the problem, as you know, is that there was a time in this world when a 16-year-old really did become an adult. A 16-year-old did get married. A 16-year-old not only joined the army, but they joined the religious orders and so forth. They started a family. They had a job and so forth. And somehow, you know, and I haven't touched, of course, the issue of the age of confirmation. That's another issue. But they expected, they expected to be adults. We don't expect our kids to be adults till they're in their 40s, all right, you know? They're just still, I mean, they've got jobs. But still, in terms of responsibility, in terms of sacrifice, in terms of, you know, a live a life. You heard that famous story, I've told it before. You know, the Pope's visiting a parish in Rome and some lady shouts out of him, you know, so what should I do to my, my son? He's 35 years old, he's still living at home. The Pope looks up and says to her, stop doing his laundry. Okay, right? We don't expect our young people to grow, spiritually, naturally, any way at all, and so forth. All right? So we would need a very radical revolution here at Transfiguration to see the power of confirmation at work. I know Justin Corner sitting in the corner. He's ready to do that. I know the folks here in leadership. We're ready to do that. And it's going to take that.
confirmation is by and large a joke. Not that the spirit is a joke, not that the grace is a joke, not that the objective qualities of confirmation are a joke. They are very real, real as ever, powerful as ever. But we are stacking the deck against anything happening for our young people. And we've got to decide. I mean, I don't know what else you all are busy with. Oh, I have my club and so forth. And yes, all these children are going to hell in a handbag, but I've got my stuff and so forth. Who's going to do it? It's got to be the parents and the grandparents. So watch me this year. My focus, with all due respect to the little ones, is on the parents and the grandparents. You cannot drop the ball on this. You cannot give it over. You know, I've said this to the young people themselves. You know the problem in our religious education? I call it the drop-off, drop-out approach. We drop our kids off to get somebody to do the work for them. And surprise, surprise, the result of that is they drop out. If we've got to stop the drop-off culture in our parish, where somebody else's job is to do all the heavy lifting with the spiritual work. That's why I love couples for Christ. Because they're busy people. You know, you know what? I've, I've heard Filipinos have more times. <laughs> I'm challenging the white people here because I think sometimes, oh, isn't it wonderful that they do that? They're, that's, they're into this stuff. They're not into this stuff. They're busy. They've got families. They're, and they're, okay. But I thank God that Couples for Christ says that it is not mere icing on the cake to devote ourselves to evangelization, to help people of every age encounter Jesus Christ, the power of the Spirit, and then to keep on helping them in their marriages and families as well as singles and so forth. There's a whole number of groups represented here that are doing that. And I thank God for you. Because this is what it's going to take. It's going to take not dozens, but hundreds and hundreds of transfiguration prisoners saying, Father Bear, sign me up. I don't know. I'm 66. I don't really enjoy being around kids more than Christmas and so forth, you know. Uh, but if you need grandparents to help bring the Holy Spirit to these young people, I'll do it. We need hundreds of you. If we've got 50 young people being confirmed, we need a lot of you. And of course, we need to work and pray for our parents and grandparents, especially. This is a revolution, okay? It's going to take a lot. It's very costly. Grace is not cheap. But I'm convinced that the Lord wants transfiguration to be a place where people get transfigured. You know, when I got that call from the Archbishop, I said, cool. Cool name. Now, I would have been happy with, you know, St. Hedwig and so forth. I'm <laughs> looking up her life and find out. Oh, okay. Well, when I heard transfiguration, I thought, there's something here. There's something here. Jesus Christ shining in us first. And then Jesus Christ shining through us. And uh, later on in this uh, conference, we're going to pray for one another. We're going to pray for a deeper outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit, I know He's in you. Yes, He's in you. We're going to pray that you'll let Him out. That you'll take the lid off. That you will stop telling God what He can do and cannot do. Stop that. Stop that. You know, as a priest, I learn not to do that. All right? There are so many things that God calls me to do that have nothing to do with what I learned in seminary. Have nothing to do with what I prefer to do. You know? You know, I, I, I take these tests, you know, I come out as an introvert. In fact, the vast majority of priests are introverts. Vast majority, all right? Okay? And an introvert prefers not to be speaking on a Saturday morning with all of you wonderful <laughs> people and so forth. Sorry, we've all got a job to do. And we're going to be praying here at Transfiguration, not just so you get sprinkled with a little Holy Ghost dust over here, and you get a little blessing over there. We're praying that just like in the Acts of the Apostles, the Holy Spirit would rock this place. Not just the first Pentecost, but there's a second Pentecost in the Acts of the Apostles. There's all kinds of things happening here. Over and over again. That the Lord would shake us up out of our complacency. That the Lord would make this not a perfect place, and certainly not a, a perfectly organized place, a smooth place, but a place where the Holy Spirit is at work. Deeply. Conversion. Grace, holiness, all the gifts and graces of the Holy Spirit. Let's decide today, at least, let's decide today, at least, we will say yes to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our souls and the souls of our family members and at Transfiguration Parish. Thank you, and God bless you.
is my grandmother. Interestingly, I lived in Baltimore. My grandmother once said when I was a child about Hubert H. Humphrey, butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. <laughs> um, I think it takes more than just a simple uh, comment. Let me make at least three. The first is this is that, as I said last week, this sacrament has a bit of an identity crisis. If you know the brief history of it, again, people initiated into the early church received uh, what we now call the three sacraments of initiation. Baptism, chrismation or confirmation, and first Holy Communion, Eucharist, and so forth. Those three held together in certain parts of the world all the way till the present time. You may know some Greek Orthodox people, etc. And they will, they will confirm and give a little tincture of the consecrated precious blood even to a newborn and so forth as they're baptized. So there are places in the world where children are, quote, confirmed, they phrase it differently, as newborns, irritable and sacred. The same is true for other parts of the Catholic Church in which the rituals of the rites uh, follow those parts, especially in other parts than in our Western Roman rites and so forth. Now, uh, as time went on, again, it became, uh, as the church grew, frankly, the, the issue was if you look to have there's some reason why the church believed that a bishop should be the one who celebrates the sacraments of initiation. But as dioceses got bigger and more varied and so forth, and they weren't able to do that, again, what happened was some of the sacraments, especially baptism, which was considered so essential for salvation, it is essential for salvation, they were given quickly and immediately by the parish priest and so forth, whereas the bishop could only come around traveling as he did in order to give confirmation. So you began to see the separation between baptism and confirmation happened in some ways uh, because of geography. Now, as far as the age of when that happened, again, it started by being, you know, any kid, anybody, here comes the bishop every three years to visit your little mountain hill town. So anybody of any age that needs to get confirmed, whether they're a year and a half old or eight and a half years old and so forth, they would get confirmed. So there was not a particular age. And that's, again, all these things are still true in certain parts of the world where you may not have the ability for a bishop to visit. Then what happened was it was standardized. I think what happened here, uh, say in more recent history, the last hundred years, is this. As you know, the age of reason for receiving first a confession and first Holy Communion was only really standardized around the world uh, 110, 115 years ago and so forth. Uh, so children, you know, my grandmother, I think I told you once, she was thrilled. She remembers as a little girl uh, when the Pope, uh, again, uh, a Pope, you know, uh, uh, good Pope St. Pius, uh, not St. Pius, uh, who was it, Pope? St. Pius X. St. Pius X, yes, he was St. Pius, thank you very much. Pope St. Pius X, you know, he re basically reduced the age, and my grandmother was thrilled that she could now receive Holy Communion as a second grader, whereas before it was more typically fourth or fifth grade. Well, what happened as part of that was the great question of exactly how long do you wait until you confirm? And here's where you have the endless discussions. Again, in some cases you say, well, let's go back to my anthropological notion of elimination. Let's have it at some place in a young person's life where they're making that transition from childhood to adulthood. Okay, fine, except you go from culture to culture about every 10 years, that age differs. I told some of you at Mass that uh, the recent surveys are that the typical person is leaving the church, young person is leaving the church at the age of 13, seventh grade. You would have probably guessed high school or college, all right? It used to be high school or college. Now people are dropping out in part because parents don't go to church, much less make their kids go to church, etc. So when do you confirm? If it was when they're going to have to start to stand up for the faith, okay? Uh, that might be around preschool these days, all right? <laughs> so that alone, is, then there's the other issue of, do we have a sense of vocation here? That this is, that when a child starts to think about, what am I supposed to be in life? You want it to correspond, and you receive the Holy Spirit to guide you in your important decisions. Once again, if people aren't getting married until they're 35, and they're not doing it until they find a good place in Bermuda to have their destination wedding and so forth, maybe we shouldn't confirm people until they're 35. So there's many issues around it. I moved, as you know, a few years ago from the 10th grade that was here to 8th grade. I did it for a few reasons, including a greater likelihood that while they're still in our system, both our Catholic grade school and the active faith formation program 8th grade, it was more likely both that they would really get a more thorough initiation, but also have a decent fighting chance to be able to, uh, again, follow through in some ways. Whereas with many high school students, you know, they take a brief break from hockey practice, they go over to get their mandatory minimalistic confirmation program, then they get the official certificate and bye-bye forever and so forth. So there's different issues like that. I really, if, if again, if we could really have this whole place going as it is, I would still keep 
the confirmation eighth grade. The main thing I would do would be to make our school focused, focused like a laser on the fact that our goal is to get our students to heaven and the grand culmination of our eighth grade uh, conclusion at Transfiguration Catholic School is to receive the power, the grace, the strength, the witness, the hundreds of parishioners cheering them on to be confirmed for their next stage in life. So I would keep it at eighth grade. I would just add a lot more to what we're doing to prepare. I saw a hand up. Yes? Yeah, in, in, in India, Kerala, there is a right, they give uh, uh, the babies, uh, at the time of baptism, newborns, they give the blood on the tongue. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's right. Yes, they're very, very not unusual in many parts of the world. That's right. Yes. Um, so many young people that I know um, have issues with some of the teachings of the church. Mm -hmm. And I have a good friend whose daughter uh, would not get confirmed because she didn't agree with the church's stance on gay marriage. And I tried to explain the church's teaching to her at length, and it just wasn't going anywhere. Um, and I'm just wondering, is that what they should do if they have, if they have a disagreement with the teaching of the church? Should they not get confirmed, or should I have encouraged her to get confirmed anyway? No, that's a good question. If you didn't hear it, uh, and this is becoming increasingly the case. Increasing numbers of young people are saying they don't wish to be confirmed. They don't agree with the church's teaching about this or that. And uh, I thought you said this is a free choice. I'm making my free choice. I don't wish to be confirmed. Here comes mom. You're going to get confirmed, him, and I've got the dress ready and everything else. Uh, very, very important question. You have to take at least one step back before that and say, you know, do we say what we mean? And uh, do we mean what we say? That is, this is an adult conscience decision. Most of them never chose to be baptized. They were little babies and so forth. Now it is an adult choice. Uh, and so uh, I would say theoretically, theologically, you may not force a person to be confirmed, uh, especially if they're of that age. Again, it's a different thing if they're a little one-year-old and so forth, right? Now, the problem with that is, in this age of choice, in this age of, you know, do I wish you know, Coca-Cola free versus cherry flavored Pepsi, you know, caffeine and so forth, you know. Uh, we're setting our children up to be very superficial about this whole thing. You know, let's use the example. You said, you know, someone doesn't agree with the church's position about gay marriage and so forth, so they don't want to be confirmed. Let's take a few steps back and say, what did the teachers do in anticipating this, you know? A lot of Catholic teachers, a lot of Catholic parents, a lot of Catholic priests are incredibly naive, you know? We just... We just expect these children just to, I don't know what, to ignore all these pressures all around them about these hot issues, you know. Uh, you can't do that anymore and so forth, all right? So, you know, I don't want to jump on that child and say, you know, what? You know, you don't automatically believe everything. I mean, like somebody should have been working for a few years in this direction. So, pastorally speaking, in that situation, because it happens here at Transfiguration, uh, pastorally speaking, I invest in the, the individual student, their family, their teachers, uh, to see if we can bring about them coming to agree with the Catholic Church's teaching. And interestingly, in most cases they do. It's just that finally someone worked with them and so forth. You know, we've got to work with our young people. I mean, you, hundreds of us. You know, what do you think they're looking at TV and their, their phones all day long? It's just anti-Catholic, anti-Catholic, anti-Catholic. And so now you young people want to join the Catholic Church, don't you? It's like, come on, people. So once again, we, we are, we, we're just going to have to shape the parish differently. You know, I've said this to some of you. You know, when people join this parish now, it's not just like, oh, isn't that nice? Like, hey, you're in the army now. Okay? Okay? What are you going to do? You know, why should we let you in? Isn't that awful? All are welcome. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no. The days of passive Catholics. It's over. And I, I guess I wish it wasn't, because, you know, it means more work for us to organize everything and so on. But we've got to do it. So, again, we have to take a couple steps back from these moments of crisis and say, where have we not been doing the necessary work? And it involves the parents, the teachers, the priests. Trust me. You know, I'll be honest with you. I'll lay my cards out on the table. You know, a lot of my preaching is for five or ten years from now when some of the bottoms really drop out of our society, okay? Listen closely to what I preach about all the time. It might be a lot of different. A lot of it is, you know, God didn't promise you a rose garden, okay? To be a Catholic, you're going to have to sacrifice. You're going to have to suffer. You're going to have to stand up. I'm saying that to our young people. I'm saying that to our parishioners. 
even if right now they still go over to Hy-Vee and have a, a cafe latte and so forth, all right? Because I'm just, I'm responsible for souls. If I see a wolf over the next hill, I can't say, well, he's over the next hill. You know, golly, you know? Uh, <laughs> I can't do that as a pastor. I've got to get the sheep ready for what's over the next hill. What's over the next hill? I don't think, I mean, come on, folks, you know? I mean, really, do you think no matter who wins this election, we're going to turn around into it's a big, wide, wonderful world that we live? So what? What are we doing to prepare our children? I told you about this remarkable family I knew in Akron, Ohio. They said, Father, we're training our, our children to be saints and heroes and martyrs. And they were. For example... It was up to the children to bake the bread in their families. If the children didn't bake the bread, they had no sandwiches, they had no food. They relied on the children to do certain things. Children! They expected the children to carry their weight in having their life together as a family. They deliberately looked for ways, get this, for their children not to do what all their friends did. They listened closely to what everyone else was getting for Christmas and made sure their children didn't get those things. What horrible fact. They should be taken away from their children. Maybe. <laughs> Unless you're trying to change, uh, prepare people to be heroes and martyrs. And I really believe that part of the motivation for me in praying and working for more of the Holy Spirit to fall upon transfiguration is because we're going to need the Holy Spirit. Okay? We ain't going to have all kinds of other things. It's God alone. And we better just get ready for that and develop habits of being able to do that. As much as I hate the fact that we didn't have heat on in the church today, it's something wrong with the boiler thing and all. I thought, think of all those. You see those pictures. Those Catholics in Russia. Those Catholics all over the world. <laughs> just, just the roof. Much less heat and so forth. All right? They've got something to teach us. And what many of them have is a deep, very quiet, they're Russian, you know, deep abiding sense of the Holy Spirit's gifts and graces. So, once again, let's expect more of the Holy Spirit. Let's really be prepared to say, Lord, whatever you need from me, I want to assist in the grace of the Holy Spirit filling the earth. Once again, thank you very much. We'll see you next week. God bless you.